Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Deborah Axelrod, and on behalf of Dr. Myers, who is the director of the Survivorship Program at the Perlmutter Cancer Center, and myself, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this evening's event, which is the Faces of Cancer, Champions of LGBTQ Cancer Care. Can everybody hear me? Gwen? Okay. Yep, we hear you. Okay, great. Uh, we ran a program uh, similar to our survivorship program last uh, last week on locally advanced and metastatic uh, cancers, cancers of all types. And uh, we, we try to do something different every June. Uh, and last June, we also ran an LGBTQ survivorship panel. Um, it was successful. We were excited about it. And we decided that we would repeat uh, something similar, not a panel, but a panel of champions. And I'm going to I'm, I'm going to introduce Dr. Dom Gower in just a minute. But a little bit about our outreach. Uh, our community outreach is into its uh, 20th year. We focus on risk reduction, diagnosis, treatment, survivorship. It includes workshops, lectures, brown bag lunches and screenings. We created the first Arab American program of breast cancer outreach called AMBER the Arab American Breast Cancer Education Resource Program with videos and materials. It was the uh, first one in the country and we, we were uh, awarded a grant from the Komen Foundation for eight consecutive years. Um, so that's a little bit about us. Now, um, our focus tonight is on the LGBTQ community and the cancer community. So um, the LGBTQ network um, estimates about four and a half percent of uh, the U.S. population, which identifies as LGBTQ, which is over 11 million people with an estimated 1 million cancer survivors. And there are health disparities in this population, which are caused by multiple factors. They are caused by a combination of social, economic behaviors and the stress of living as a sexual gender minority in this country. And this doesn't even begin to touch on the biologic and physiologic differences in the trans population for those who are transitioning. The big picture culturally is that there has been a title shift in this population from an openly gay secretary of transportation to a transgender assistant secretary of health and gay football players. Gay pride in 1970 started with 400 homosexuals during the Stonewall uprising commemorated by Whoa. five, sorry, by 5 million in 2019 at the 50th anniversary in New York City. I only have a few more minutes, <laughs> but progress is uneven geographically and in socioeconomic ways. For instance, the shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando um, was uh, obviously a glaring example. Um, but before you jump to conclusions that this only happens in the South, uh, we have the case of the Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission in which the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the baker. From a socioeconomic point of view, this marginalized community has persisted in the same way redlining has continued to make it difficult for Blacks to improve their housing and environmental conditions. And also from an economic point of view, that's more germane to us, there are disparities in health insurance for transgender communities. Something surprising that I learned, that was 25% of Fortune 500 companies exclude transgender surgical care in their insurance plans and 60% of transgender patients go out of state for care. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dom Gower. Oh, one other piece of information that I thought was very interesting is that New York City has over 700,000 people that identify as LGBTQ, the highest in the nation, and not San Francisco. So I was a little surprised by that. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dom Gower, who is a radiator. I know Dr. Dom Gower very well as a radiation oncologist, and I'm, I'm very um, proud to be involved in the initiative that he um, and um, Gwen Quinn and many others who you'll hear from have created here at the Cancer Center. So uh, Jason, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be involved with this and to have gotten to know everybody on this call over the past few years. Um, so as uh, Deborah just said, my name is Dr. Dom, Jason Domagower. I go by he, my pronouns are he, him, and I'll be 
uh, assuming the role of director of the Perlmutter Cancer Center's LGBT program uh, when I join faculty next year. So we just have some slides before we introduce our amazing panel. And I just wanted to set the stage that everyone here is welcome. I really want to ensure that this is a safe and brave space for people to feel uh, available to ask questions to our amazing panelists uh, and really just to be who you are and really to, to embody what uh, Deborah was just saying in terms of pride and being our true authentic self in these cases. So I just wanted to share some of the efforts that the Perlmutter Cancer Center has done to date. So the Perlmutter Cancer Center's LGBT Cancer Care and Research Program was launched in 2020 with the amazing efforts from a lot of individuals that are on this call with four main pillars of delivering LGBT affirming care, developing strong relationships with our LGBTQ plus community partners, advancing cancer research for LGBTQ plus patients and implementing inclusive LGBTQ plus organizational change. One of the cornerstones that we have was involvement of our community partners very early on with the mentality of nothing about us without us. So one of the first efforts we did was establish the Patient and Family Advisory Council, which consists of individuals either who themselves have undergone a cancer diagnosis or their chosen family or biological family with the mission to identify opportunities to meet the physical, psychological, and spiritual needs of our LGBTQ plus community uh, members through a partnership between our patients, their chosen family, and staff. Also, in the importance of uh, providing a safe space for our faculty and staff, we created a task force which advocates for and identifies opportunities to improve the care of LGBTQ plus identifying patients while creating a safe and equitable environment for all PCCs, patients, and staff with the understanding that by being able to be your true self in your work environment, you are able to thrive and make the space a better place. We created welcoming environments to ensure that we have, uh, that people come into our building and spaces feeling that they can be their true self to receive the care by being who they are. We developed brief multi-session programs on LGBT cultural humility trainings and delivered at up to this time, 33 trainings across PCC locations, as well as 10 trainings in Brooklyn sites, and created a graduation signage for those departments and places that have completed those trainings. One of the major efforts was making sure that we are knowing who our patients are by asking sexual orientation and gender identity so that we can tailor care and build a repository of research for eligible patients to better understand disparities and gaps in care. And I'm very excited to announce that when we first started this, uh, this work, in September 2020, we saw that only 17% of individuals had sexual orientation completed and 21% had gender identity completed. But through a lot of efforts and a lot of amazing work by our, our team, these numbers have now been consistently close to 90% completed of our patients that are coming in to receive care, which is allowing us to be better able to tailor care for our patients and identify gaps in care for those uh, members who are some of the most vulnerable community uh, coming from some of the most vulnerable communities. We also, as you'll hear from Alex, hired a dedicated staff individual. So Alex is the LGBT program coordinator who serves as a liaison between our community partners as well as the Cancer Center and helps navigate patients to inclusive and equitable care. And also we are very proud to be part of the research community and NYU will be hosting the first annual Science of Cancer Health Equity in Sexual and Gender Minority Communities. So I encourage all on the call to uh, look into this a little bit more and we welcome you to register and be part of this. We really are going to be working together to identify gaps in care and really move the needle forward to ensure that all, all individuals, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity, have access to world-class equitable care. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce our panelists for the evening. So first is Rebecca Markson. Uh, she, her, is a family medicine physician who focuses on LGBTQ plus health at the FGP clinics uh, uh, in NYU and Chelsea. Uh, her lived experience as a queer person brings passion to her work in providing primary care to the LGBTQ plus population. Her spectrum of care includes preventative visits, both general and gynecologic, sexual health providing PrEP and contraception, and gender-affirming hormone therapy for trans patients. Next is Marina Sasenko. Uh, she is a gynecologic oncologist taking care of patients at NYU Langone, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. She completed her medical training at Cornell Residency and OB-GYN at the University of Michigan and fellowship in gynecologic oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. 
She also serves on the Perlmutter Cancer Center LGBTQ Plus Leadership Council and is a team member for the LGBT Perlmutter Cancer Center uh, program. Next is Gwendolyn Quinn. So Gwendolyn Quinn is, uh, Dr. Gwendolyn Quinn is Livia Van Endowed Chair, Vice Chair of Research and Professor in the Department of ob and Population Health, Division of Medical Ethics, and also a team member in the Perlmutter Cancer Center. Her research focuses on social determinants of health, as well as reproductive health and ethics in underserved and minority populations, including adolescents and young adults and sexual and gender minorities. Alex Trivenos, uh, he, him, is a program coordinator for the LGBTQ plus care and research program at the Perlmutter Cancer Center. And he joined NYU Langone Health as a medical assistant in 2020, and then transferred to the Perlmutter Cancer Center work as um, a health navigator, community health navigator, navigating patients to their care. Originally, Alex is from Uzbekistan, where he trained as a physician assistant. He is, Alex has a clinical as well as research background and is very passionate about LGBTQ plus care and fighting the barriers to care for LGBTQ plus patients. Abraham Tachu is the Assistant Director of Clinical Operations in the Perlmutter Cancer Center, but doesn't like me talking too much about his role, so I will leave his brief. Um, and then uh, really well, excited to welcome Russell uh, Lair, who is a who has worked for the Union's Actors Equity Association for over 20 years as a negotiator and a researcher after a backstage Broadway career. He and his husband, Dr. David Rosen, live in New Jersey City, where they're active in the LGBTQ plus IA uh, youth services and outreach. Um, Dr. Michael Grossbart and Dr. Evans have treated Russell uh, since his diagnosis of stage two Hodgkin's, Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2018, and he credits their care for helping him uh, achieve remission. And we are very excited to have Russell serve as one of the PFAC members that I had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and really open up the floor for questions. I do have some questions to start us off and I'm gonna unstop sharing my screen so we can see everybody. And so I would like to start off to the group with asking, just really interested, what made you initially interested in LGBTQ plus care, especially within cancer? So I'm gonna first ask uh, Dr. Quinn or Gwendolyn Quinn to ask uh, for their uh, background. Yeah, thanks, Jason, and thanks to everyone for listening in today uh, and to all the panelists. For me, my, my work started in fertility preservation with adolescents and young adults with cancer. And around that time, we realized that some people who were um, pursuing gender affirming hormones or um, surgeries were also going to be at risk for loss of fertility. And so it expanded to the broader LGBTQ plus community that we want to be sure that um, neither clinicians make assumptions that because someone is LGBTQ, they're not interested in family building. And at the same time, we need to help educate patients that there are options for them, you know, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. So that is my goal and my involvement in here, make sure everyone has access to quality reproductive health care. Wonderful, thank you very much, Gwen. Um, next, uh, I'm Dr. Uh, Dr. Marina Sisenko. What brought you into LGBT care and what specifically within uh, cancer? Uh, thanks, Jason. So I'm gonna tell a little bit of an anecdote. Um, and this was from my uh, training. I was a resident and I had um, uh, the privilege of taking care of this lovely patient, Ms. Z. And she um, was uh, diagnosed with ovarian cancer and she, uh, uh, um, it's kind of hard to tell her story, but um, I met her on her first day at our clinic and she presented with abdominal bloating, ascites, which is a pretty common uh, way that, that ovarian cancer presents. And her doctor had assumed that she uh, was a baseball playing drunk, basically. She drank a lot with her friends during her baseball games and she must have liver failure. And that's why she has ascites and no one bothered to uh, figure out what was going on with her. Um, and of course she had ovarian cancer. Um, and I, when I looked at her, I saw all of my friends. I saw all of my friends fast forward 30 years, all of my baseball, softball playing friends who were now, you know, in their, in their fifties. Um, and it, it just kind of shook me a little and it kind of made me wonder, well, you know, all the risk factors I learned for ovarian cancer patients seem to apply to my friends and my, you know, my, my group of friends, and, and maybe there's something there. And as a fellow, um, 
fast forward now 15 years, 10 years, um, my friend and I, my colleague and I tried to figure out if this was real, like do lesbian women have a higher rate of ovarian cancer? And we could not figure this out. And we couldn't figure this out because there is absolutely no data capturing sexual orientation or gender identity in any, at least at that time, in any system, in our hospital system, in our large data, our, our large cancer databases, literally nothing. We could not find a single paper outside of case reports. And it felt defeating. It felt defeating in the sense that the, I, I have this question, I have this query, I have this like um fascination that I think can help my 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 community and yet I can't answer it um and even as, when I as a fellow I was on my hospital's board working to improve soji data collection uh, which was going nowhere fast and then I graduated and I had the opportunity to to meet uh Dr. Quinn and and Dr. Damagawa who kind of immediately took me into their fold to say we we've got this we're doing exactly what you are what you um what your question is, right? And and so I've been part of this lovely, amazing group ever since, since now three years, almost to the day. Um, and I think, and, and Dr. Damagara kind of showed you the statistics of what we've accomplished with Soji data collection and has really um, skyrocketed. So my question is not answered. I still um, have uh, a lot of work to do to figure out exactly uh, who who is at risk and, and kind of what the statistics are in our own community as far as GYN cancers. But um, at least we are starting the ball rolling and getting this data collected. Absolutely, thanks Marina. Uh, next, Rebecca, what brought you into an interest in LGBT health? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I think, you know, just generally being within the primary care sphere, um, when patients encounter the healthcare system, oftentimes they are coming to, you know, the primary care doctor first. And it's up to us to, you know, make sure patients are all up to date with their cancer screenings. Um, I, in as a family medicine trained physician, at least have some training in gynecologic care. Um, so. I have really enjoyed in residency and then in my practice doing PAPs to help screen for cervical cancer. Um, you know, we try to use standard guidelines in determining who we initiate screening um, for cancer um, screening. As uh, Dr. Sazanko was saying, you know, there still is such a paucity of data when it comes to what are the cancer rates specifically within the LGBTQ community. So I'm glad. NYU is making an effort to increase SOGI data collection. So hopefully we can contribute to a growing body of research and, you know, does cancer screening change um, within the population? Um, and then specifically within the LGBTQ space, you know, as someone who identifies as queer and is in the community and has had, you know, personal experiences and then experiences among my friends where, they enter the healthcare system and, you know, are met with, you know, uncomfortable encounters from, you know, provider. And obviously this isn't everywhere, but there is a higher rate of um, LGBTQ people having negative experiences within the healthcare system and not being appropriately screened because of that. Um, you know, just wanting to make a difference for me, for my friends, and then for the community. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Russell, what made, and Russell, same question, what makes you interested in LGBT care or in advocacy? Um, I was both blessed and privileged to have very, um, uh, inviting and accepting and, uh, supportive care when I was going through and I continue to go through my cancer journey. But uh, almost to Rebecca's point, you know, as you are going through this, you start finding out what a larger community you're part of, and you start talking to people about their experiences. And I was so disheartened to hear about some of the barriers my friends um, had faced. And um, to be able to uh, give any kind of insight into what the other side of the chair looks like. Um, and to make that better and to increase that kind of direct care and remove those barriers is, is kind of my calling. So um, 
I appreciate that I've been given an opportunity to do it with NYU. Thank you so much. And uh, last but not least, Alex, same uh, question for you. Sure thing. Um, I'll speak from the LGBTQ plus patient advocacy perspective that I've been serving as the patient navigator at the Cancer Center for quite some time. And then uh, recently I've shifted my navigation completely to LGBTQ plus patient. And what I've seen that every patient has their unique story, right? Uh, uh, we are part of the community and however we all hold, we all have uh, some individual story that uh, is fascinating and also um, uh, sometimes very, uh, very scary when a patient tells you that. So um, from screening and prevention to uh, treatment survivorship, uh, I think that most importantly, we have to look at the health disparities and the gaps and barriers to care that patients facing, and then try to address them uh, and get get our patient to care, right? And most importantly for screening and prevention, but if you find something, we need to make sure that uh, we get the patient to the right specialist and get um, uh, get them to the proper treatment that they, they, they deserve. Wonderful, thank you all for answering that question. and be Going off of the title of this LGBTQ plus champions, you all kind of mentioned as part of your story what brought you into LGBT health is some of your own individual experiences. I'm curious on what you think being an LGBTQ plus champion means. So this can be open to anybody to answer depending on what they think uh, a champion actually is. I'll take that one. Um, I think it's twofold, right? Part of it is certainly um, in your day-to-day -day practice kind of sh outwardly showing that you um, are willing to listen, to understand, to, to ask the, the questions of your patients to make sure that they feel like you are, um, you are on their side as a lot of patients don't necessarily have doctors on their side or haven't necessarily seen doctors be on their side. Um, but I think, and that's and that may be everything from you know the the uh, posters on the wall to gender neutral bathrooms to literally asking somebody's like who is this person sitting next to you are they your friend are they your partner are they your mom or your whatever you know what I mean like something as simple as that um, but I think the other part of it is the the non patient facing part of this right this is the the research part the advocacy part the pushing our institution to say um, the lack of, of data is not okay. It is the, the, the questioning of our societies and saying, why aren't we doing this research? Where's the money for this research? Um, so I think that, that being a champion, while our patients want to see um, us being the good doctor that we are, I think it's just so much more. It's that behind the scene that the, the work that we do, that may be the silent work, the work that, that our patients may not even know that is happening, but that opens the door to the next generation of doctors to make their lives easier or um, finds money for research in uh, sexual orientation and gender identity disparities. Like that is just as important as the forward facing that, that um, the front facing that we do every day. I agree Wonderful. with that. Thank and you. while I can't say it anything any better than Marina just did, I think it's also important to using the Martin Luther King quote that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, that we're all humans. And if we see someone, um, even on a day to day basis, if we overhear someone being misgendered or we hear someone making a negative comment or a slur, you know, within the NYU system, we have training, you know, about how to deal with that. And we can't just be uh, bystanders to those types of things that happen. I would say from I, my perspective, it kind of boils down to putting empathy forefront um, and making sure that that is always part of your considerations and also challenging conventional wisdom. Great, thank you so much. And I guess the next thing is for those who find a calling or find that pull to it, what are opportunities that people can get more engaged and be a champion in their spaces, whether that is on a smaller scale, grander scale, what, what advice do you have for other people who are feeling that, that call to, to arms or to call to action? 
Um, I can start with that one. Um, you know, I think a, one thing that I've done that I think is kind of what anyone can do too is, so in my residency training, there really wasn't a lot of family medicine practitioners or there wasn't really a pathway um, for residents to learn more about LGBTQ health. You know, there's a lot of data that shows in medical school and residency, there is not a ton of training. There's, you know, majority of schools maybe have a maximum of like two hours of didactic learning. There's no specific requirement for clerkship learning, which I know NYU is doing a lot of work on trying to enhance that for their NYU medical students. But, you know, if there is an interest on your own, like I, like I and like anyone else, you know, find those resources that are accessible to you. So in my training, I found the people who are providing HIV care and PrEP, and I found the specialists who are doing, um, you know, gender affirming hormone therapy. So I found spaces within a network where I could get more training and just try to ask as many questions as possible. Um, you know, and I think that's such a great thing about NYU um, is that now we do have like an advisory council. So there is a bit of cohesion and there's a lot of people championing LGBTQ uh, healthcare. So there's a lot of resources for people to, you know, collaborate and get together and try to learn from each other um, you know, I'm, I still constantly in my own practice will consult colleagues who do similar things uh, to me, you know, whether I have questions about um, prep, screening, hormone therapy, where, you know, we share experiences and try to better ourselves for our patients. But I think just realizing that you don't have to do all of your research alone is that like, I think what's so important is collaboration and connecting with people who are already doing this so we can just support each other and continue to grow. Um, I think for, from, from multiple perspectives, it's just the, the being involved, right? Like just showing up, um, whether it's from the patient perspective of being in, you know, there are support groups that, are, that may be more related to your disease type or something of that nature, your presence, your being at those meetings, you're, you're speaking up and saying like, you know, introducing your partner, um, the visibility sometimes speaks volume, even if you're not necessarily the, the flag waving, uh, you know, front runner, um, just the physical being there sometimes is enough. That's wonderful. One of the things that I that's always struck me is the importance of intersectionality and identifying and appreciating intersectionality because we are, as has kind of been mentioned before, we are all made up of various aspects of our identity that kind of collect in on who we are as a person and how we interact with the world and how social determinants of health kind of work on that. And to me, that also speaks to the importance of allyship. So we all have different ways that we interact with the world, but we're all not able to speak on a specific group's experiences, right? Because we all have different experiences. So being members or involved in this space, how can we also serve as allies for other marginalized groups, both within our communities or outside of our communities? I'll jump in on that a little bit. Um, I, I think when you look at how any situation affects a specific group and you look at the underlying, um, the actual base question for what the best practice would be underneath it, you see how it affects other organizations, other communities. Um, like uh, I have a very good friend who in trying to find a new uh, specialist, um, she, started going and her intake experience with different doctors has been terrible. She's been in the waiting room and she gets called by her dead name or with the wrong gender um, uh, as Mr. instead of Mrs. or Miss. And you know that's a barrier to care that is not just felt by the transgender community. 
if you if you have a best practice in your organization to always use someone's title, that's missing a whole swath of the community that would rather their title, including doctors, may not be used in calling you to your appointment, right? In the same way you wouldn't want to necessarily just said at a cocktail party um, for all the questions that'll be asked next time you're there. But also there are communities that if you don't use it, it's a sign of disrespect. So instead of coming up with one set of practices that you think will apply to everyone, you know, changing your intake practice to actually ask people, everyone, how they would like to be addressed when they're called into their appointment will make everyone's experience better. But you can see the lens of why it's necessary when you look specifically through, in this case, a transgender lens. That's how you find where the same issue is impacting multiple communities, but they may not be raising their voices. Just also, on those same lines, sorry, Alex, I think to the concept of intersectionality, we talk about the LGBTQ plus community being an invisible minority, because if you have a disability, if you are a non-white race, most times the world can tell that by looking at you. But these are identities that are may not be known unless a person discloses them. And so we have to, you know, as others have said before, create safe spaces for that disclosure. But at the same time, we maybe we've gotten away with this with the with racial and ethnic minorities. If I'm giving you this information, what are you giving me back that recognizes uh, or acknowledges that you've heard this information? So we just don't want to collect it to collect it. Um, but we want to respond to that, acknowledging that people are more than just their sexual identity or, or their gender identity or their sexual orientation. We are our religions. We are our partner status. We are our disability status. And all those things make up the whole of, of who we are. We are not just the ovarian cancer in room 10. Thank you, everybody. So I'm going to ask a, a question uh, for Alex, uh, Rebecca, and Russell. So we know that there are cancer disparity, there are disparities that impact the LGBTQ plus communities across the cancer spectrum from prevention, screening, diagnosis, treatment, end of life care. In your experiences in advocacy, navigation, and primary care, like what are some of the experiences you've had with engagement with the LGBT community and why it's so important to engage early on in those preventative areas? I'll take on that one first. Um, so lots of my patients who are, contact me through uh, either liaison email or just through uh, my uh, work email. They all come to to me without even a primary care physician, right? So that's where all the cancer screening and prevention starts, for example, right? So I feel the most important thing is education, right? You have to educate uh, the patient who comes to you. Why do they need the appropriate cancer screening? Why do they need a certain test? Why, why do they need a certain vaccination? And uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Markson and I work very closely with uh, uh, lots of our patients in primary care, uh, um, and I navigate a lot of the refugee patients. Dr. Markson has witnessed uh, lots of times that I've given education speeches before uh, uh, before they actually agree to complete a certain test. So I feel like uh, trust and education are uh, two very important components to. Uh, um, uh, cancer prevention screening, as well as the uh, diagnosis, uh, survivorship, and uh, tr treatment survivorship. I think, yeah, I think there's uh, piggybacking off of that. There's so many different components. You know, I think once we have patients within the healthcare system and they feel safe and comfortable, that's like step one, because we want to make sure that there's follow-up for um, if there's anything detected. 
I think two definitely is education. Um, you know, especially as it relates to um, some of the more like reproductive related cancer screen screenings. I think they're at least with my experience so far, you know, not going on statistics, but there certainly is some misinformation, especially as it relates to pap screenings. Um, you know, the phrase like if you have it, pap it, there's a lot of trans patients who don't necessarily realize that once they're on hormone therapy, they need to get their cervical cancer screening or they're nervous about getting screening because, you know, it's can be remind, uh, like a reminder of, or dysphoric of, you know, body parts that they have that are not consistent with how they identify. Um, so yeah, definitely, I think, a lot of education and then even me as a provider, making sure that I'm aware that screening shouldn't change and in fact should still be kept consistent. Um, and yeah, so educating patients, again, making them feel comfortable so that, and we're reminding them, you know, how frequently to get screened and then kind of going on what we keep saying, um, throughout this talk is making sure that we're collecting sexual orientation and gender identity information so that we can learn if these screening guidelines should change based on, you know, differing cancer rates. And I'd say um, from the moment you get on the flume ride, which is a cancer diagnosis, you know, so much happens so quickly. And if you're in an environment that is not inviting, and open to your health advocate of choice, which may be more than one person. Um, it may not be the same person each time. It may be someone who may not be fully aware of, especially if you're dealing with youth, fully aware of someone's SOGI situation and their identity and their reality. Uh, these are things that have to be taken into account so that the best care is being given so that the follow-up can be done, so that the patient understands what is their role in their treatment and that there's someone else that can help them be um, accountable to that. And having that open environment where you can bring anyone you need to and that they're as accepted as you are because you are the patient is critical to the care. Thank you, Russell. Kind of jumping off of that, I have a directing the question to Marina of some people say that what is the necessary of asking these questions? So I'm curious if you've had a situation as an oncologist where having that information, the sexual orientation, gender identity, either change care or kind of change your interaction or relationship with your patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my the, my practice is both where I operate on patients and I provide chemo. I often take care of patients for um, the duration of their disease, which can be months and can be years. Um, and I form uh, very significant relationships with these patients. And there is no um, no way for me to do my job well for uh, when taking care of these patients without the involvement of their families whether um, whether they're chosen families or or, or whatnot. Um, and so literally every single one of my patients, I know their significant others. I know their um, living situation. And I, I can't emphasize to you enough how challenging it is when a pa I have a patient in a situation where I can't know their 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 family situation. Um, it, it influences everything from, can this patient get the care, the chemo that they need to how can I get this person to the emergency room to how quickly do they need, do I need to discharge them? Do they have care at home? What does the care look like? Will they have somebody to call 911 in the middle of the night if something were to happen? Because if not, then maybe I need to keep them in the hospital longer. And these decisions, um, May, may not be, seem very large in, in, in kind of each decision in itself, but in the end, literally create 
the, the environment that I can deliver my care. Um, and so without knowing their backgrounds, I cannot be the good doctor that I am to my patients. And that is bottom line and a discussion period. Thank you. And that really kind of touches on like so the importance of social determinants of health. And for those who are not familiar with, with that, it's like, how do we interact with the environment that we live, that we work, that we play, that we, our spiritual environment. And I know this really comes into, uh, Gwen, your space and your research, and also Alex, this comes into how you navigate. So I'd, I'd love for either one of you or anybody else to kind of comment on the importance of social determinants of health in patient care, especially within the cancer space. Well, just like we said for intersectionality, we are also a self that is representative of our childhood and the experiences that we've had. And so there's a many parts, you know, to what we are and how we are. And I think um, like Marina gave a really good example about, you know, knowing the social environment of your patient is your patient you know, have to go up several flights of stairs and can they do it? And, um, you know, did they have access and what are their social supports and what are the identities that are important to them? Yes, and uh, just to add is that we have to remember that uh, as Dr. Damagawa has mentioned about, you know, the, there are types of social determinants of health, right? That we, we care about, right? Uh, there are several main ones that, for example, if patient doesn't have enough food, they probably will not be thinking about to get the cancer prevention test, right? If they have not don't, don't have a roof over their over their head, same thing. If they don't have a job stability, right? If they don't have a job, obviously they they'll be um, very anxious about about that and probably not go to the doctor to get a certain um, checkup or. Uh, uh, or uh, prevention test done, right? So you have to remember all the social aspects and and that they they affect patient care significantly, right? Um, patient will will forget about uh, their health if uh, something social is uh, not stable or not right or not what it, where they want it to be. Fantastic. One of the things that we've also noticed, and then this is open to everybody, is we oftentimes will see primary care being more interested or having more of that self-directed learning in regard to LGBTQ plus health and wellness. But sometimes patients require or individuals require more advanced or specialized care. And a lot, we tend to see that fall off as Rebecca was saying that medical education in LGBT and training is already pretty low but that falls off even more as one becomes more specialized. So how do we kind of approach, or how do, how do you all recommend or have insight into how do we approach that transition from primary to secondary specialized care to ensure that people still are able to navigate those safe spaces and still have that equitable welcoming environment? Um just jumping on right on this question, but uh, yeah, we need, to, we need to make sure that we have a list of proficient providers, right, within our network. We need to know uh, within all specialties, we need to have a proficient provider and share that list with uh, primary care providers to make sure that uh, they know where to send their patient, right? Uh, we and we all have to communicate uh, be, with with each other if uh, we can't find one, right? So. Um, I feel like communication and uh, building referral or network is really important. Jason, it makes me think of a, a segue into um, what we've all probably encountered a lot is that you have many very good clinicians who believe that they're good clinicians, care about people, but yet don't think it's important to know the sexual orientation or the gender identity because they're a good doctor, because they treat everyone the same. And I think all of the points that you've brought up about social determinants of health and intersectionality point to the fact that none of us are all the same. None of us would benefit from the same care. We benefit more from care that is tailored to those parts of our identities that we have said are important to us. 
And and uh, Dr. Quinn just literally mentioned the definition of health equity for for some people who don't do not know what it is. <laughs> and I'd say you know, just because you have someone that you know is a specialist in the field or is comfortable with these issues doesn't let everyone else off the hook. Um, because of that equity issue, if you are uncomfortable because you don't know as the clinician how HRT is going to affect the chemo drugs you're dealing with, that's for you to be educated on. Uh, I'll put it on you as the clinician, not for you to send it to someone else who may not be a specialist in that form of cancer, but just because they happen to know how HRT works. That's not doing the best for the patient. And so how do we serve them as advocates in that space? So what are, what are ways that we can make the institution or whatever environment that, we're exist, that we exist in for attendees, whether they are patients, whether they are uh, healthcare providers, what are ways that we can create a, an environment that promotes that change? How do we self-advocate? How do we advocate for others? Like, what are the best strategies that you've either experienced yourself or can kind of speak to? I feel like um, there's so many different ways to approach it. I think, you know, if patients are listening to this or other providers, I think have the patience, compassion, and willingness to understand that if you don't know the answer, it's possible no one knows yet because the research isn't out there. So I think a willingness to work with patients and, you know, there's so many things I learn on a daily basis, regardless of it's LGBTQ related. So kind of take that same compassion within the LGBTQ sphere. Um, you know, a common phrase that I feel like as physicians we use is, um, I don't know, but I'm going to look it up for you, <laughs> you know, um, and just have that script that we use and then have patients know that, you know, that it's possible that your doctor may not have the right answer immediately and to just be compassionate with that. If, you know, your doctor is willing to work with you, that's like a big step that shows that they care. So I think it's being compassionate on both ends. Um, and, you know, maybe it does take having like a champion or an advocate in all these subspecialties to kind of spearhead um, some endeavors to, you know, push forward specialties within the LGBTQ sphere. I think, as you've been saying, like, I think it takes leadership and then, you know, people kind of following along with that to, um, you know, be an impetus for change. So I think continuing to advocate, continuing to communicate, continuing to be supportive and understanding is um, going to be what continues to be important in making sure that we um, move forward within this space in healthcare. Thank you. And I kind of want to, Gwen, I'm going to ask you some question. I ask you a question in regard to the importance of research in this space. It's been alluded to a few times of lack of information and how importance of data collection. Um, so speaking on the research of what specific research is important that you've worked in and how do we advocate for a better inclusion and why that is important? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people have covered it. I mean, from an epidemic. Epi epidemiological perspective, we really don't know specific incidence and prevalence of cancer types. Um, and so we can't talk about risk, you know, with the general public. One of those reasons is because the SEER site, which collects cancer, um, you know, all the national cancer data does not have that in a field. Um, the other issue, like, well, it's, it's great that people's electronic medical records are beginning to create spaces or and collect it. We're not currently collecting it in a uniform way. 
So it may be challenging to merge data together um, from multiple sites to you know, really get a good national sense of things. So the more research that we do, the more um, we can answer some of those questions. And you know, as you know, the National uh, Institute of Health commissioned the National Academies to develop some SOGI questions that they hoped might help harmonize data collection. But I don't think that they created those questions truly with the community. And so now we're finding that those questions may not be acceptable. We're never gonna get our answers if people feel offended by those questions. So there's so many areas, and I think maybe Rebecca was alluding to this, like we don't really know um, if you have a hereditary cancer disposition and you taking gender affirming hormones, if that, you know, we can guesstimate that it does, but I think to the extent that we can say something definitively, then there's, that's when shared decision-making really occurs between the patient and the clinician, because the clinician has the information that is needed for this patient to make, or for them to jointly make the decision about what's right for them. And we just currently don't have that in so many different areas. That's so true. Well, I've been really, it's been inspiring listening to all of you and I really appreciate all your time. Before we wrap up, I really would like to give you all an opportunity to share your final thoughts as, as well as kind of thinking towards the future. What is one or two things that you would like to see change in LGBT care either at NYU specifically or just in a broader sense. So I'm going to start with Alex and then we'll go to Russell, Rebecca, and then um, Gwen. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so I think number one thing is that we have to uh, kind of work together on a lot of things, right? Um, sometimes work uh, tends to be siloed uh, unintentionally. So uh, we just need to make sure that we kind of collaborating all together and contributing all the resources into one big uh, pile in, the, in order to make sure we deliver uh, um, great care to our patients. Well, I would like to make two points. One, someone put in the chat, which is a very important point about health literacy and health literacy goes in both directions. So we're training clinicians, but we're also sometimes having to re-educate patients. I'll say sometimes, especially LGBTQ patients or really anybody when it comes to, to cancer. But you know, because of the decades of mistrust in this community, it makes sense that they feel that the best information they get is from their peer groups or on social media, and it isn't always accurate. So um, I think understanding that while clinicians need to be educated on how to be culturally humble um, to provide the best care to this community, we have to understand that patients are coming in with misperceptions and then my second point I want to make is to put a plug for the conference in October because it's really not aimed at scientists. We really want patients or caregivers with cancer experience, um, people from the community to help us together set an agenda or where are the gaps? Because the things that I think, you know, as I'm sitting in, in my office that are important may not be important to the community. And the, community may want to know, hey, is it true, and I think everybody wants to know this, that we shouldn't have uh, sex while we're on chemo because we may potentially be transmitting that chemo to our partner. I don't think that's something that we definitively have an answer about. Um, but those are the things that we need the community to come and tell us, this is what's important to me. I'm gonna be very much from my own perspective, um, bringing families and patients into the discussion and um, not just when they're in the fog of diagnosis. You know, I am much clearer about what was appropriate and what could have been improved about my treatment now that I'm out of it um, and bringing in the advocates and the families into it as well, because that perspective, when you're the third, I view um, is critical. 
and is uh, sometimes clearer, that's all. Rebecca, final thoughts? Yeah, I think pretty much just what everyone else is saying. I, I feel like just ultimately, I feel like there would be such a benefit from collaboration, you know, among practitioners, between practitioners and patients, and just within NYU as a whole to figure out, I feel like there's always going to be room for improvement um, in all these different ways. And I feel like we get so focused in our own work that I think we don't realize how important it is for just like holistic patient care that we can't, we can't just work individually. We have to all work together in improving care. Beautifully said all of you, I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna share my screen one more time as a way of just being able to, if anybody has any questions, want to learn more, or has anything that, to reach out to any of our community members, or they themselves would like to be navigated to uh, the Perlmutter Cancer Center or the NYU system as a whole for their own care or the care of others, please feel free to reach out to, the, to us. We can get you in contact with the, the correct people. Alex will likely be the person you'll be connected with.